when insurrections die. Brest-Litovsk, 1917 and 1939. If the Russian Revolution becomes the signal for a proletarian revolution in the West so that both complement each other, the present Russian common ownership of land may serve as the starting point for a communist development. Marx Engels, preface to the Russian edition of the Manifesto, 1882. This perspective was not realized. The European industrial proletariat missed its rendezvous with a revitalized Russian peasant commune. Brest-Litovsk, Poland, December 1917. The Bolsheviks propose peace without annexations to a Germany intent on taking over a large swath of the old Tsarist Empire, stretching from Finland to the Caucasus. But in February 1918, the German soldiers, proletarians in uniform though they were, obey their officers and resume the offensive against a Russia still ruled by Soviets. No fraternization occurs and the Revolutionary War advocated by the Bolshevik left proves impossible. In March, Trotsky has to sign a peace treaty dictated by the Khazar's generals. We're trading space for time, as Lenin put it, and in fact, in November, the German defeat turns the treaty into a scrap of paper. Nevertheless, practical proof of the international link-up of the exploited had failed to materialize. A few months later, returning to civilian life with the war's end, these same proletarians confront the alliance of the official workers' movement and the Freikorps. Defeat follows defeat. In Berlin, Bavaria, and then in Hungary in 1919, the Red Army of the Ruhr in 1920, the March Action in 1921. September 1939. Hitler and Stalin have just carved up Poland. At the border bridge of Brest-Litovsk, Several hundred members of the KPD, refugees in the USSR, subsequently arrested as counter-revolutionaries, or fascists, are taken from Stalinist prisons and handed over to the Gestapo. 1917-1937, 20 years that shook the war. The succession of horrors represented by fascism, then by World War II and the subsequent upheavals, are the effect of a gigantic social crisis opening with the mutinies of 1917 and closed by the Spanish Civil War. This is a shorter, entirely reconceived version of the preface to the collection Bilan Contre Revolution en Espagne, 1936 to 1939, Paris, 1979, now out of print. A text in progress will deal further with the question of the development of fascism and thus of anti fascism in our own epoch. Yeah. Fascism and Big Capital If it is precisely the case, to use the formulation made famous by Daniel Guren, that fascism serves the interests of big capital, 99% of the people articulating this perfectly accurate thesis hasten to add that, in spite of everything, fascism could have been averted in 1922 or 1933 if the workers' movement and or the Democrats had mounted enough pressure to bar it from power. If only, in 1921, the Italian Socialist Party and the newly founded Italian Communist Party had allied with Republican forces to stop Mussolini. If only, at the beginning of the 30s, the KPD had not launched a fratricidal struggle against the SPD. Europe would have been spared one of the most ferocious dictatorships in history. A Second World War, a Nazi empire of almost continental dimensions, the concentration camps, and the extermination of the Jews. Above and beyond its very true observations about classes, the state, and the ties between fascism and big industry, this vision fails to see that fascism arose out of a twofold failure. The failure of the revolutionaries after World War I, crushed as they were by social democracy and parliamentary democracy, and then, in the course of the 1920s, the failure of the Democrats and Social Democrats in managing capital. Without a grasp of the preceding period as well as of the earlier phase of class struggle and its limits, the coming to power and, still more, the nature of fascism remains incomprehensible. For the rest, it is no accident that Guerin misjudges both the popular front, in which he sees a failed revolution, and the real significance of fascism. What is the real thrust of fascism, if not the economic and political unification of capital? 
a tendency which has become general since 1914. Fascism was a particular way of bringing about that unity in countries, Italy and Germany, where even though the revolution had been snuffed out, the state was unable to impose order, including in the ranks of the bourgeoisie. Mussolini was no Thiers, with a solid base of power, ordering regular armed forces to massacre the communards. An essential aspect of fascism is its birth in the streets, its use of disorder to impose order, its mobilization of the old middle classes half-crazed by their own decline, and its regeneration, from without, of a state unable to deal with the crisis of capitalism. Fascism was an effort of the bourgeoisie to forcibly tame its own contradictions, to turn working-class methods of mass mobilization to its own advantage, and to deploy all the resources of the modern state, first against an internal enemy, then against an external one. There was indeed a crisis of the state, during the transition to the total domination of capital over society. First, work organizations had been necessary to deal with the proletarian upsurge. Then, fascism was required to put an end to the ensuing disorder. This disorder was, of course, not revolutionary, but it was paralyzing, and stood in the way of solutions which, as a result, could only be violent. The crisis was only erratically overcome at the time. The fascist state was efficient only in appearance because it forcibly integrated the wage-labor workforce and artificially buried conflicts by projecting them into militarist adventure. But the crisis was overcome, relatively, by the multi-tentacled democratic state established in 1945, which potentially appropriated all of the fascism's methods and added some of its own, since it neutralizes wage work organizations without destroying them. Parliaments have lost control over the executive, with welfare or with workfare, by modern techniques of surveillance or by state assistance extended to millions of individuals, in short, by a system which makes everyone more and more dependent. Social unification goes beyond anything achieved by fascist terror, but fascism as a specific movement has disappeared. It corresponded to the forced march discipline of the bourgeoisie under the pressure of the state, in the particular context of newly created states, hard-pressed to also constitute themselves as nations. The bourgeoisie even took the word fascism from working-class organizations in Italy, which were often called fasci. It is significant that fascism first defined itself as a form of organization and not as a program. Its only program is to organize everyone, to forcibly make the component parts of society converge. Dictatorship is not a weapon of capital, as if capital could replace it with other, less brutal weapons. Dictatorship is one of its tendencies, a tendency realized whenever it is deemed necessary. A return to parliamentary democracy, as it occurred, for example, in Germany after 1945, indicates that dictatorship is useless for integrating the masses into the state at least until the next time. The problem is therefore not the fact that democracy ensures a more pliant domination than dictatorship. Anyone would prefer being exploited in the Swedish mode to being abducted by the henchmen of Pinochet. But does one have the choice? Even the gentle democracy of Scandinavia would be transformed into dictatorship if circumstances demanded it. The state can only have one function, which it fulfills democratically or dictatorially. The fact that the former is less harsh does not mean that it is possible to reorient the state to dispense with the latter. Capitalism's forms depend no more on the preferences of wage workers than they do on the intentions of the bourgeoisie. Weimar capitulated to Hitler with open arms. Leon Blum's popular front did not avoid fascism, because in 1936, France required neither an authoritarian unification of capital nor a shrinking of its middle classes. There is no political choice to which proletarians could be enticed or which they could forcibly impose. Democracy is not dictatorship, but democracy does prepare dictatorship and prepares itself for dictatorship. The essence of anti-fascism consists in resisting fascism by defending democracy. It no longer struggles against capitalism, but seeks to pressure capitalism into renouncing the totalitarian option. Since socialism is identified with total democracy, and capitalism with an accelerating tendency to fascism, the antagonisms between proletariat and capital, communism and wage labor, proletariat and state, are rejected for a counterposition of democracy and fascism, presented as the quintessential revolutionary perspective. The official left and far left 
tell us that a real change would be the realization, at last, of the ideals of 1789, endlessly portrayed by the bourgeoisie. The new world? Why, it is already here, to some extent, in embryos to be preserved, in little buds to be tended. Already existing democratic rights must be pushed further and further within an infinitely perfectible society, with ever greater daily doses of democracy, until the achievement of complete democracy, or socialism. Thus reduced to anti-fascist resistance, social critique is enlisted in dithrams to everything it once denounced, and gives up nothing less than that shop-worn affair, revolution, for gradualism, a variant on the peaceful transition to socialism, once advocated by the communist parties, and derided, before 1968, by anyone serious about changing the world. The retrogression is palpable. We won't invite ridicule by accusing the left and the far left of having discarded a communist perspective, which they knew in reality only when opposing it. It is all too obvious that anti-fascism renounces revolution. But anti-fascism fails exactly where its realism claims to be effective, in preventing a possible dictatorial mutation of society. Bourgeois democracy is a phase in capital's seizure of power, and its extension in the 20th century completes capital's domination by intensifying the isolation of individuals. Proposed as a remedy for the separation between men and community, between human activity and society, and between classes, democracy will never be able to solve the problem of most separated society in history. As a form forever incapable of modifying its content, democracy is only a part of the problem to which it claims to be the solution. Each time it claims to strengthen the social bond, democracy contributes to its dissolution. Each time it papers over the contradictions of the commodity, it does so by tightening the hold of the safety net which the state has placed under social relations. Even in their own desperately resigned terms, the anti-fascists, to be credible, have to explain to us how local democracy is compatible with the colonization of the commodity, which empties out public space and fills up the shopping malls. They have to explain how an omnipresent state to which people constantly turn for protection and help, this veritable machine for producing social good, will not commit evil when explosive contradictions require it to restore order. Fascism is the adulation of the statist monster, while anti-fascism is its more subtle apology. The fight for a democratic state is inevitably a fight to consolidate the state, and far from crippling totalitarianism, such a fight increases totalitarianism's stranglehold on society. Rome, 1919 through 1922. The countries where fascism triumphed are also the countries in which the revolutionary assault after World War I matured into a series of armed insurrections. In Italy, an important part of the proletariat, using its own methods and goals, directly confronted fascism. There was nothing specifically anti-fascist about its struggle. Fighting capital compelled workers to fight both the black shirts and the cops of parliamentary democracy. Fascism is unique in giving counter-revolution a mass base and in mimicking revolution. Fascism turns the call to transform the imperialist war into civil war against the workers' movement, and it appears as a reaction of demobilized veterans returning to civilian life, where they are nothing, held together by nothing but collective violence and bent on destroying everything they imagine to be a cause of their dispossession, troublemakers, subversives, enemies of the nation, etc. Thus, from the outset, fascism became an auxiliary of the police in rural areas, putting down the agricultural proletariat with bullets, but at the same time developing a frenzied anti-capitalist demagogy. In 1919, when it represented nothing, fascism demanded the abolition of the monarchy, the senate, and all titles of nobility, the vote for women, the confiscation of the property of the clergy, and the expropriation of the big landowners, and industrialists. Fighting against the worker in the name of the producer, Mussolini exalted the memory of the Red Week of 1914, which had seen waves of riots, particularly in Ancona and Naples, and hailed the positive role of unions in linking the worker to the nation. Fascism's goal was the authoritarian restoration of the state, in order to create a new state structure capable, in contrast to democracy, said Mussolini, 
of limiting big capital and of controlling the commodity logic which was eroding values, social ties, and work. Traditionally, the bourgeoisie had tried to deny the reality of social contradictions. Fascism, on the contrary, proclaimed them with violence, denying their existence between classes and transposing them to the struggle between nations, denouncing Italy's fate as a proletarian nation. Fascist repression was unleashed after a proletarian failure engineered mainly by democracy and its main fallback options, the parties and the unions, in tandem. It is false to present fascism's arrival in power as the culmination of street battles in which it defeated the workers. In Germany, the proletarians had been crushed 11 or 12 years earlier. In Italy, they were defeated by both ballots and bullets. In 1919, federating pre-existing elements with other elements close to him politically, Mussolini founded his fasci to counter clubs and revolvers while Italy was exploding along with the rest of Europe. Democracy called for a vote, from which a moderate and socialist majority emerged. Victory. The election of 150 socialist deputies was won at the cost of the ebb of the insurrectionary movement and the political general strike, and the rollback of the gains that had already been won, Bordigia commented 40 years later. At the time of the factory occupations of 1920, the state, holding back from a head-on assault, allowed the proletariat to exhaust itself. With the support of the CGL, a majority socialist union, which wore down the strikes when it did not break them openly. As soon as the fasci appeared, sacking the Casse di Popolo, the police either turned a blind eye or confiscated the workers' guns. The courts showed the fasci the greatest indulgence, and the army tolerated their exactions when it did not actually assist them. This open but unofficial support became quasi-official with the Bonomi Circular of October 20th, 1921 providing 60,000 demobilized officers to take command of Mussolini's assault groups. What did the parties do? Those liberals allied with the right did not hesitate to form a national bloc, including the fascists, for the elections of May 1921. In scruple, the PSI concluded a meaningless pacification pact, whose only concrete effort was to further disorient the workers. Faced with an obviously political reaction, the CGL declared itself apolitical. Sensing that Mussolini had power within his grasp, the union leaders dreamed of a tacit agreement of mutual tolerance with the fascists and called on the proletariat to stay out of the face-off between the CP and the National Fascist Party. Until August 1922, fascism scarcely existed outside the agrarian regimes, mainly in the north, where it eradicated all traces of autonomous agrarian worker unionism. In 1919, fascists did burn down the headquarters of the socialist daily newspaper, but they held back from any role as strike breakers in 1920, and even gave verbal support to worker demands. In the urban areas, the fasci rarely were dominant. Their march on Ravenna, September of 1921, was easily routed. In November 1921, in Rome, a general strike prevented a fascist congress from taking place. In May 1922, the fascists tried again and were stopped again. The scenario varied little. A localized fascist attack would be met by a working-class counter-attack, which would then relent following calls for moderation from the reformist workers' movement as soon as reactionary pressure tapered off. The proletarians trusted the Democrats to dismantle the armed bands. The fascist threat would pull back, regroup, and go elsewhere, over time making itself credible to the same state from which the masses were expecting a solution. The proletarians were quicker to recognize the enemy in the black shirt of the street thug than in the normal form of a cop or soldier, draped in a legality sanctioned by habit, law, and universal suffrage. At the beginning of July 1922, the CGL, by a two-thirds majority, against the communist minority's one-third, declared its support for any government guaranteeing the restoration of basic freedoms. In the same month, the fascists seriously stepped up their attempts to penetrate the northern cities. On August 1st, the Alliance of Labor, which included the Railway Workers Union, the CGL, and the anarchist USI, called General Strike. Despite broad success, the Alliance officially called off the strike on the 3rd. In numerous cities, however, it continued in insurrectionary form, which was finally contained only by a combined effort of the police and the military supported by naval cannon 
and of course, reinforced by the fascists. Who defeated this proletarian energy? This general strike was broken by the state and the fasci, but it was also smothered by democracy, and its failure opened the way to a fascist solution to the crisis. What followed was far less a coup d'etat than a transfer of power with the support of a whole array of forces. The quote-unquote march on Rome of the Duce, who actually took the train, was less a showdown than a bit of theater. The fascists went through the motions of assaulting the state, the state went through the motions of defending itself, and Mussolini took power. His ultimatum of October 24th, we want to become the state, was not a threat of civil war, but a signal to the ruling class that the National Fascist Party represented the only force capable of restoring state authority and of assuring the political unity of the country. The army could still have contained the fascist groups gathered in Rome, which were badly equipped and notoriously inferior on the military level, and the state could have withstood the seditious pressure. But the game was not being played on the military level. Under the influence of Badoglio, in particular, the commander-in-chief in in 1919 through 1921, legitimate authority caved in. The king refused to proclaim a state of emergency, and on the 30th he asked the Duce to form a new government. The liberals, the same people anti-fascism counts on to stop fascism, joined the government. With the exception of the socialists and the communists, all parties sought a rapprochement with the PNF, and voted for Mussolini. The parliament, with only 35 fascist deputies, supported Mussolini's investiture 306 to 116. Giolitti himself, the great liberal icon of the time, an authoritarian reformer who had often been president of the state council before the war and who had again been head of state in 1920 to 1921, whom fashionable thought still fancies in retrospect, as the sole politician capable of opposing Mussolini, supported him up to 1924. The dictator not only received his power from democracy, democracy ratified him. We might add that in the following months, several unions, including, among others, those of the railway workers and the sailors, declared themselves national, pro-patriotic, and therefore not hostile to the regime. Repression did not spare them. They say talk that talk, walk but please avoid the streets Lock the jaw, lock the door, avoid the speech Cause once you speak, bullshit reek like oil leak Turin, 1943 If Italian democracy surrendered to fascism almost without a fight, the latter spawned democracy anew when it no longer corresponded to the balance of social and political forces. The central question of 1943, as in 1919, was how to control the working class. In Italy, even more than in other countries, the end of World War II shows the class dimension of international conflict, which can never be explained by military logic alone. A general strike erupted at Fiat in October 1942. In March 1943, a strike wave rocked to Turin and Milan, including attempts at forming workers' councils. In 1943 to 1945, Worker groups emerged, sometimes independent of the CP, sometimes calling themselves Bordigists, often simultaneously anti-fascist, Rossi, and armed. The regime could no longer maintain social equilibrium, just as the German alliance was becoming untenable against the rise of the Anglo-Americans, who were seen in every quarter as the future masters of Western Europe. Changing sides meant allying with the winners-to-be, but also meant rerouting worker revolts and partisan groups into a patriotic objective with a social content. On July 10, 1943, the Allies landed in Sicily. On the 24th, finding himself in a 1917 minority on the Grand Fascist Council, Mussolini resigned. Rarely has a dictator had to step aside for a majority vote. Marshal Badalio, who had been a dignitary of the regime ever since his support for the March on Rome, and who wanted to prevent, in his own words, the collapse of the regime from swinging too far to the left, formed a government which was still fascist but which no longer included the Duce, and turned to the democratic opposition. The Democrats refused to participate, making the departure of the king a condition. After a second transitional government, Badalio formed a third in April 1944, which included the leader of the Communist Party, Toliatti. 
Under the pressure of the Allies and of the CP, the Democrats agreed to accept the king. The Republic would be proclaimed by referendum in 1946. But Badalio stirred up too many bad memories. In June, Bonomi, who 23 years earlier had ordered the officers to take over the fasci, formed the first ministry to actually exclude the fascists, and the situation was reoriented around the tripartite formula PC plus PS plus Christian democracy, which would dominate in both Italy and France in the first years after the war. This game of musical chairs, often played by the self-same political class, was the theater prop behind which democracy metamorphosed into dictatorship, and vice versa. While the phases of equilibrium and disequilibrium in the conflicts of classes and nations unleashed a succession and recombination of political forms aimed at maintaining the same state, underwriting the same content. No one was more qualified to say it than the Spanish CP, when it declared, either out of cynicism or naivete, during the transition to, from Francoism to democratic monarchy in the 1970s. Quote unquote, Spanish society wants everything to be transformed so that the normal functioning of the state can be assured, without detours or social convulsions. The continuity of the state requires the non-continuity of the regime. Volksgemeinschaft versus Gemeinweisen. Counter-revolution inevitably triumphs on the terrain of revolution. Through its people's community, National Socialism would claim to have eliminated the parliamentarism and bourgeois democracy against which the proletariat revolted after 1917. But the conservative revolution also took over old anti-capitalist tendencies. The return to nature, the flight from cities. That the workers' parties, even the extremist ones, had negated or misestimated by their inability to integrate the A-classist and communitarian dimension of the proletariat by their inability to critique their economy, and their inability to think of the future world as anything but an extension of heavy industry. In the first half of the 19th century, these themes were at the center of the socialist movement's preoccupations, before they were abandoned by Marxism in the name of progress and science, and they survived only in anarchism and sects. Volksgemeinschaft versus Gemmenwesen, People's Community or the Human Community, 1933, was not the defeat but only the consummation of the defeat. Nazism arose in triumph to diffuse, resolve, and to close a social crisis so deep that we still don't fully appreciate its magnitude. Germany, cradle of the largest social democracy in the world, also gave rise to the strongest radical, anti-parliamentary, anti-union movement, one aspiring to a worker's world, but also capable of attracting itself many other anti-bourgeois and anti-capitalist revolts. The presence of avant-garde artists in the ranks of the German radical left is no accident. It was symptomatic of the attack on capital as civilization in the way that Fourier criticized it. The loss of community, individualism, and gregariousness. Sexual poverty, the family both undermined but also reaffirmed as a refuge, the estrangement from nature, industrialized food, Increasing artificiality, the prostheticization of man, regimentation by time, social relations increasingly mediated by money and technique. All these alienations pass through the fire of a diffuse and multiformed critique. Only a superficial backward glance sees this ferment purely through the prism of its inevitable recuperation. The counter-revolution triumphed in the 1920s only by laying the foundations, in Germany and in the U.S., of a consumer society and of Fordism, and by pulling millions of Germans, including workers, into industrial commodified modernity. Ten years of fragile rule, as the mad hyperinflation of 1923 shows. This was followed in 1929 by an enormous earthquake, in which not the proletariat, but capitalist practice itself repudiated the ideology of progress and an ever-increasing consumption of objects and signs. Nazi extremism and the violence it unleashed were adequate to the depth of the revolutionary movement it took over and negated, and to these two rebellions separated by ten years against capitalist modernity, first by proletarians, then by capital. Like the radicals of 1919 through 1921, Nazism proposed a community of wage workers, 
but one which was authoritarian, closed, national, and racial. And for 12 years, it succeeded in transforming proletarians into wage workers and soldiers. Berlin, 1919 through 1933. Dictatorship always comes after the defeat of social movements. Once they have been chloroformed and massacred by democracy, the leftist parties and the unions. In Italy, several months separated the final proletarian failures from the appointment of the fascist leader as head of state. In Germany, a gap of a dozen years broke the community and made January 30th, 1933 appear as an essential political or ideological phenomenon, not as the effect of an earlier social earthquake. The popular basis of National Socialism and the murderous energy it unleashed remains mysterious if one ignores the question of the submission, revolt, and control of labor, and of its position in society. The German defeat of 1918 and the fall of the empire set in motion a proletarian assault strong enough to shake the foundations of society, but impotent to revolutionize it thus bringing social democracy and the unions to center stage as the key to political equilibrium. The social democrats and union leaders emerged as men of order and had no scruples about calling in the Freikorps, fully fascist groupings with many future Nazis in their ranks, to repress a radical worker minority in the name of the interests of the reformist majority. First defeated by the rules of bourgeois democracy, the communists were also defeated by working-class democracy. The work councils placed their trust in the traditional organizations, not in the revolutionaries easily denounced as anti-democrats. In this juncture, democracy and social democracy were indispensable to German capitalism for regimenting the workers, killing off the spirit of revolt in the polling booth, for winning a series of reforms from the bosses, and dispersing the revolutionaries. After 1929, on the other hand, capitalism needed to eliminate part of the middle class and to discipline the proletarians and even the bourgeoisie. The workers' movement, defending as it did political pluralism and immediate worker interests, had become an obstacle. As mediators between capital and labor, working class organizations derive their function from both, but also try to remain autonomous from both and from the state. Social democracy has meaning only as a force contending with the employers and the state, not as a force absorbed into them. Its vocation is the management of an enormous political, municipal, social, mutualist, and cultural network, along with everything which today would be called associative. The KPD, moreover, had quickly constituted its own network, smaller but vast nonetheless. But as capital becomes more and more organized, it tends to pull together all its different strands, bringing a statist element to the enterprise, a bourgeois element to the trade union to bureaucracy, and a social element to the administration. The weight of working class reformism, which ultimately pervades the state, and its existence as a counter society, make it a factor of social conservation and Malthusianism, which capital in crisis has to eliminate. By their defense of wage labor as a component of capital, the SPD and the unions fulfilled an indispensable anti-communist function in 1918 through 1921. But this very same function later led them to put the interest of the wage labor workforce ahead of everything else, to the detriment of the reorganization of capital as a whole. A stable bourgeois state would have tried to solve this problem by anti-union legislation, by recapturing the worker fortresses, and by pitting the middle class, in the name of modernity, against the archaism of the proles, as Thatcher's England did much later. But such an offensive assumes that capital is relatively united under the control of a few dominant factions. But the German bourgeoisie of 1930 was profoundly divided. The middle classes had collapsed, and the nation-state was in shambles. By negotiation or by force, modern democracy represents and reconciles antagonistic interests to the extent that it is possible. Endless parliamentary crises and real or imagined plots, for which Germany was the stage after the fall of the last socialist chancellor in 1930, in a democracy, are the invariable sign of long-term disarray in ruling circles. <laughs> 
At the beginning of the 1930s, the crisis whipsawed the bourgeoisie into irreconcilable social and geopolitical strategies, either the increased integration or the elimination of the workers' movement, international trade and pacifism, or autarky, laying the foundations of a military expansion. The solution did not necessarily imply a Hitler, but it did presuppose a concentration of force and violence in the hands of the central government. Once the centrist reformist compromise had exhausted itself, the only option left was a statist, protectionist, and repressive. A program of this kind required the violent dismantling of social democracy, which in its domestication of the workers had come to exercise excessive influence, while still being incapable of unifying all of Germany behind it. This unification was the task of Nazism, which was able to appeal to all classes, from the unemployed to the captains of industry, with demagogy that even surpassed that of the bourgeois politicians and an anti-Semitism intended to build cohesion through exclusion. How could the working class parties have made themselves into an obstacle to such xenophobic and racist madness after having so often been the fellow travelers of nationalism? For the SPD, this had been clear since the beginning of the century, obvious in 1914, and signed in the blood in 1919 pact with the Freikorps, who were cast very much in the same warrior mold as their contemporaries, the Fasci. The KPD, for its part, had not hesitated to ally with the nationalists against the French occupation of the Ruhr in 1923, and openly talked of a national revolution to the point of inspiring Trotsky's 1931 pamphlet against national communism. In January 1933, the die was cast. No one can deny that the Weimar Republic willingly gave itself to Hitler. Both the right and the center had come around to seeing him as a viable solution to get the country out of its impasse, or as a temporary lesser evil. Big capital, reticement about any uncontrollable upheaval, had not, up to that time, been any more generous with the NSDAP than with the other nationalists and right-wing formations. Only in 1932 did Schacht, an intimate advisor of the bourgeoisie, convince business circles to support Hitler, who had, moreover, just seen his electoral support slightly decline because he saw in Hitler a force capable of unifying the state and society. The fact that the big bourgeoisie never foresaw nor still less appreciated what then ensued, leading to war and then defeat, is another question. And in any event, they were not notable by their presence in the clandestine resistance to the regime. On January 30th, 1933, Hitler was appointed chancellor, in complete legality, by Hindenburg who himself had been constitutionally elected president a year earlier with the support of the socialists, who saw him in a rampart against Hitler. The Nazis were a minority in the first government formed by the leader of the NSDAP. In the following weeks, the masks were taken off. Working class militants were hunted down, their offices were sacked, and a reign of terror was launched. In the elections of March 1933, held against the backdrop of violence by both the stormtroopers and the police, 288 NSDAP deputies were sent to the Reichstag, while the KPD still retained 80 and the SPD 120. Naive people might express surprise at the docility with which the repressive apparatus goes over to dictators, but the state machine obeys the authority commanding it. Did the new leaders not enjoy full legitimacy? Did eminent jurists not write their decrees in conformity with the higher laws of the land? In the democratic state, and Weimar was one, if there is conflict between the two components of the binomial, it is not democracy which will win out. In a state founded on laws, and Weimar was also one, if there is a contradiction, it is law which must be made to serve the state, and never the opposite. During these few months, what did the Democrats do? Those on the right accepted the new dispensation. The Zentrum, the Catholic party of the center, which had even seen its support increase in the March 1933 elections, voted to give four years of full emergency powers to Hitler, powers which became the legal basis of the future dictatorship. The Zentrum was forced to dissolve itself in July. The Socialists, for their part, attempted to avoid the fate of the KPD, which had been outlawed on February 28th in the wake of the Reichstag fire. On March 30th, 1933, 
they left the second international to prove their national German character. On May 17th, their parliamentary group voted support for Hitler's foreign policy. Nevertheless, on June 22nd, the SPD was dissolved as an enemy of the people and the state. The unions followed in the footsteps of the Italian CGL and hoped to salvage what they could by insisting that they were apolitical. In 1932, the union leaders had proclaimed their independence from all parties and their indifference to the form of the state. This did not stop them from seeking an accord with Schleicher, who was chancellor from November 1932 to January 1933, and who therefore was looking for a base and some credible pro-worker demagogy. Once the Nazis had formed a government, the union leaders convinced themselves that if they recognized National Socialism, the regime would leave them some small space. This strategy culminated in the farce of union members marching under the swastika on May 1st, 1933, which had been renamed Festival of German Labor. It was wasted effort. In the following days, the Nazis liquidated the union and arrested the militants. Having been schooled to contain the masses and to negotiate in their name, or, that failing, to repress them, the working class bureaucracy was still fighting the last war. Its furtive acts of propitiation got it exactly nowhere. The labor bureaucrats were not being attacked for their lack of patriotism, but rather as a useless expense for the capitalist class. What bothered the bourgeoisie was not the bureaucrats' lingering lip service to the old pre-1914 internationalism, but rather the existence of trade unions, however servile, containing a certain independence in an era which capital no longer tolerated any other community than its own and in which even an institution of class collaboration became superfluous if the state did not completely control it. Barcelona, 1936. In Italy and in Germany, fascism took over the state by legal means. Democracy capitulated to dictatorship, or worse, still, greeted dictatorship with open arms. But what about Spain? Far from being the exceptional case of a resolute action that was nonetheless and sadly defeated, Spain was the extreme case of armed confrontation between democracy and fascism, in which the nature of the struggle still remained the same clash of two forms of capitalist development, two political forms of the capitalist state, two state structures fighting for legitimacy in the same country. OBJECTION! So in your opinion, Franco and a working class militia are the same thing? The big landowners and impoverished peasants collectivizing land are in the same camp? First of all, the confrontation happened only because the workers rose up against fascism. All the power and all the contradictions of the movement were manifest in its first weeks. An undeniable class war was transformed into a capitalist civil war. Though there was, of course, no worked out agreement and no assignment of roles in which the two bourgeois factions orchestrated every action of the masses. The history of a class-divided society is ultimately shaped by the need to unify those classes. When, as it happened in Spain, a popular explosion combined with the disarray of the ruling groups, a social crisis becomes a crisis of the state. Mussolini and Hitler triumphed in countries with a weak, recently unified nation-states and powerful re regionalist currents. In Spain, from the Renaissance until modern times, the state was the colonial armed might of a commerce society it ultimately ruined, choking off one of the preconditions of industrial expansion, agrarian reform. In fact, industrialization had to make its way through monopolies, the misappropriation of public funds, and parasitism. Space is lacking here for a summary of the 19th century crazy quilt of countless reforms and liberal impasses, dynastic factions, the Carlist Wars, the tragicomic succession of regimes and parties after World War I, and the cycle of insurrections and repression that followed the establishment of the Republic in 1931. Beneath all these rumblings was the weakness of the rising bourgeoisie, caught as it was between its rivalry with the landed oligarchy and the absolute necessity of containing peasant and worker revolts. In 1936, the land question had not been resolved, Unlike France after 1789, the mid-19th century sell-off of the Spanish clergy's lands wound up strengthening a latifundist bourgeoisie, 
Even in the years after 1931, the Institution for Agrarian Reform only used one-third of the funds at its disposal to buy up large holdings. The conflagration of 1936 to 1939 would never have reached such political extremes up to and including the explosion of the state into two factions fighting a three-year civil war without the tremors which had been rising from the social depths for a century. In the summer of 1936, after giving the military rebels every chance to prepare themselves, the Popular Front elected in February was prepared to negotiate and perhaps even to surrender. The politicians would have made their peace with the rebels as they had done during the dictatorship of Moder Rivera, 1923 to 1931, which was supported by eminent socialists. Caballero had served it as a technical counselor, before becoming Minister of Labor in 1931 and then head of the Republican government from September 1936 to May 1937. Furthermore, the general who had obeyed Republican orders two years earlier and crushed the Asturias insurrection, Franco, couldn't be all that bad. But the proletariat rose up, blocked the putsch in half the country, and hung on to its weapons. In doing so, the workers were obviously fighting fascism, but they were not acting as anti-fascists because their actions were directed against both Franco and against a democratic state, more unsettled by the workers' initiative than by the military revolt. Three prime ministers came and went in 24 hours before the fait accompli of the arming of the people was accepted. Once again, the unfolding of the insurrection showed that the problem of violence is not primarily a technical one. Victory does not go to the side with the advantage in weaponry, the military, or in, the, in numbers, the people, but rather to the side which dares to take the initiative. Where workers trust the state, the state remains passive or promises the moon, as happened in Zaragoza. When their struggle is focused and sharp, as in Malaga, the workers win. If it is lacking in vigor, it is drowned in blood. 20,000 killed in Seville. Thus, the Spanish Civil War began with an authentic insurrection, but such a characterization is incomplete. It holds true only for the opening moment of the struggle, an effectively proletarian uprising. After defeating the forces of reaction in a large number of cities, the workers had the power. But what were they going to do with it? Should they give it back to the Republican state? Or should they use it to go further in a communist direction? Created immediately after the insurrection, the Central Committee of Anti-Fascist Militias included delegates from the CNT, the FAI, the UGT, the POUM, the PSUC, product of the recent fusion of the CP and the SP in Catalonia, and four representatives of the Generalitat, the Catalan regional government. As a veritable bridge between the workers' movement and the state, and, moreover, tied if not integrated into the Generalitat's Department of Defense, by the presence in its midst of the latter's counselor of defense, the commissar of public order, etc., the central committee of the militias quickly began to unravel. Of course, in giving up their autonomy, most proletarians believed that they were, in spite of everything, hanging on to real power and giving the politicians only the facade of authority, which they mistrusted and which they could control and orient in a favorable direction. Were they not armed? This was a fatal error. The question is not who has the guns, but rather, what do the people with the guns do? 10,000 or 100,000 proletarians armed to the teeth are nothing if they place their trust in anything beside their own power to change the world. Otherwise, the next day, the next month, or the next year, the power whose authority they recognize will take away the guns which they failed to use against it. The insurgents did not take on the legal government, i.e. the existing state, and all their subsequent actions took place under its auspices. It was a revolution that had begun but never consolidated, as Orwell wrote. This is the main point which determined both the course of an increasingly losing armed struggle against Franco, as well as the exhaustion and violent destruction by both camps of the collectivizations and socializations. After the summer of 1936, real power in Spain was exercised by the state, and not by organizations, unions, collectivities, committees, etc., even though Nin, the head of the POUM, was an advisor to the Minister of Justice, the POUM nowhere succeeded in having any influence over the police, as one defender of that party admitted. While the worker militias were indeed the flower of the Republican army and paid a heavy price in combat, they carried no weight in the decision of the military high command, which steadily integrated them into regular units, a process completed by the beginning of 1937 preferring to wear them down rather than tolerating their autonomy. As for the powerful CNT, 
had ceded ground to a CP which had been very weak before July 1936. Having elected 14 deputies to the Popular Front Chamber in February 1936, as opposed to 85 socialists, but was able to insulate itself into part of the state apparatus and turn the state increasingly to its own advantage against the radicals, and particularly against the militants of the CNT. The question was, who was the master of the situation? And the answer was, the state can make brutal use of its power when it is necessary. If the Republican bourgeoisie and the Stalinists lost precious time dismantling the peasant communes, disarming the POUM militias, and hunting down Trotskyist saboteurs and other agents of Hitler at the very moment when anti-fascism was supposed to be throwing everything into the struggle against Franco, they did not do so from a suicidal impulse. For the state and for the CP, which was becoming the backbone of the state through the military and police, these operations were not a waste of time. The head of the PSUC supposedly said, Before taking Zaragoza, we have to take Barcelona. Their main objective was never crushing Franco, but retaining control of the masses, because this is what states are for. Barcelona was taken away from the proletarians. Zaragoza remained in the hands of the fascists. Mm -hmm.